Hey everyone, welcome to the Tyler Knows Everything podcast, where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. You're going to love today's guest. Let's give it up for the highly intelligent and super interesting Ty Kudrain. Tyler Knows Everything. Well, hey, Ty Kudrain, we're glad to have you today. And uh, man, this is another special episode for me because, you know, I've been recording. I haven't released yet. You know, I'm going to start releasing in June and, I'm, you know, I'm kind of experimenting with my, my close circle of friends and, you know, just it was, it was just suggested to me by the A to Z guys, you know, hey, try it out on some of your friends. You know, all my friends are interesting mm-hmm. and they've got, they, they come from all walks of life. They've got really cool stories and they're not really experimental episodes. They've been really good you know, lots of content. So, uh, you, you know, what have, what have you been up to lately here? You know, oh yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate you. And, you know, you said all your friends are interesting. So I, I thank you for also inviting me, uh, that I don't know if I'm in an interesting group, but, <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> but no, your, your friends are interesting, man. Uh, and I, I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm in part of that group of friends. Um, I don't know if I'm as interesting as everybody else, but, uh, um, yeah, you're a cool guy. You hang out with cool people. Uh, I like to think about really cool things. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I'm Ty Kudrain. I'm an athletic agent in the area. Um, I pinch myself every day that I get to do the things that I get to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, start, you, yeah. Just like me, I think you're you're excited about Monday. Yeah, I'm excited about Monday. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, Monday Mondays in general. In general I was yeah. like, what's, what's happening Monday? <laughs> now I got a full schedule. What's going yeah. on? No. Um, yeah. Exactly. I'm excited for every day. Um, uh, you know, I started my own, um, business about six years ago and, uh, been one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. <laughs> Steve yeah. Harvey has this, uh, clip us on YouTube, you know, a long time ago that said, kind of paraphrasing, you search it on YouTube folks, search this clip from Steve Harvey. He's talking about, you know, not having regrets, Yeah. you know, take a chance on yourself. And, um, were you an employee before that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with being an employee. Yeah. But, um, you know, the main thing is to have a fulfilled career, take chances, do things you're afraid maybe to to do. That doesn't always mean owning your, own your own business, but... Yeah, I think I'm probably in the hybrid version of that where I am an employee, but my success is completely dependent upon myself, you know, because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm in a commission-based, uh, you know, career. Yeah. And so it, it feels like I'm running my own business. You know, I'm branding myself as as the guy for office technology in Southeast Texas. And, you know, if, if I show up to work and, and just kind of, you know, slough through the day, nothing's going to come into that yeah. paycheck. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I kind of found, I guess the best of both worlds of that model, but definitely being an entrepreneur is very rewarding. I've, I've been that as well, you know, in a previous career, uh, you know, I owned a, well, if you, if you work, if you, um, whatever you find yourself in, if you treat what you're doing, mm-hmm. like it's your baby, like it's your thing, you can reap the same rewards as if you, as if you, as if you owned it yourself. That's really not as important you know, sure. um, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, so I love what I do. Um, I, uh, like I said, I pinch myself every day that I get to do what I do. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's kind of how we met. We go to a lot of network, network marketing, which is, you know, yeah. it, it may be a lunch or a breakfast or, uh, you know, an after hours mixer that's hosted by a chamber of commerce or the better business bureau, any organization that wants to showcase their business and bring people in and, I was at a lot of stuff. You're at a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that's the kind of people I want in my circle. And so we just kind of gravitated towards each other and both of our mm-hmm. circles kind of mesh. You know, you already had a big circle. I had a, a circle with me and, you, you know, we're all kind of hanging out now. That's also like one of the amazing perks of <laughs> like our careers. It's like, man, we, a part of what do we do that, you know, puts money in our bank account mm-hmm. <laughs> involves just being around some really good people. I yeah. mean, that's like so amazing. I, uh, you know, I grew up in Beaumont, you know, I, well, I grew I was, grew up in Silsby, but yeah. you know, we're all Silsby, Viator, Lumber, we're all suburbs of Beaumont. Really. Yeah, I think the, the A to Z <laughs> guys are from Silsby as well. Oh, that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, I really didn't appreciate this area growing up. Didn't appreciate it. Uh, I <laughs> thought it was the armpit of the world, basically. Mm-hmm. That's probably not uh, unique. Probably a lot of people um, feel that way about the where they grew up. But um after college, coming back, starting my career, really starting to get involved in the community, get involved with uh, groups like the Beaumont Rotary Club, yeah, uh, Beaumont Chamber of Commerce. That's put me in contact with a lot of really cool people that um, I've learned so much about Beaumont and the area, the whole Golden Triangle area. 
that I never knew growing up, even though I grew up, grew, uh, grew up here. And um, uh, there's so much that goes on. Basically, the only thing we don't have is scenery. Sure. Everything else we have. It's mm-hmm. really limitless. When you really get tapped into everything that goes on in Beaumont and the area, uh, the wonderful people we have, um, it really is limitless. And, you know, shoot, I live in Silsby, got a lot of trees around my house. I feel like I'm secluded. I can be in Beaumont in 15, 20 minutes, yeah. and then I can be in Houston in an hour and a half. Got everything in the world in Houston. Uh, so I think I got the best of both worlds. You know, yeah. I'm not looking to move anywhere. Not to say that I wouldn't if I had to, but I really, I think I'm living in the greatest place in the country you know but the only thing we don't have is scenery but i can go to i can go find scenery yeah i agree and and, and y'all <laughs> when i say that ty is involved in a lot of organizations he is involved in so many things he, like i don't know if you're if you happen to be uh watching this on youtube you can see him i mean he's pretty much uh you know generic white guy but you're involved in the filipino organization uh, yeah. because you actually are filipino yeah so usually when i tell people i'm the vice president of the philippine association association of beaumont they get a a interesting look on their face, and like, I can. They're, they're thinking, "Oh, why?" Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm a quarter Filipino. I'm basically the only white guy on the board. The other ten board members are all born in the Philippines, mm-hmm. and they've so come, they obviously look different. Yeah, yeah. they. Yeah, that you can tell. You can definitely mm-hmm. tell when you look at them. Right. My grandfather is full Filipino. Oh, okay. Wow. So that's not very far away. I mean, that's just uh-huh. you know one generation skipped over. Yeah, right. he speaks broken English. Mm-hmm. Um, he says a lot of cool, f- unique, weird phrases that sound very close to what, you know, things like, I'm going to go to the Horizon store instead of Horizon, you know. So how much time did he spend <laughs> over there? Well, he was actually born in Hawaii. Oh, his, okay. his mother and father immigrated here, I think, illegally in the, yeah. in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, well, I had to be the 30s because he was born in 30 Are there a lot of Filipinos in Hawaii? Uh, yeah. Uh, in California a lot. Okay. Um, uh, I, uh, so he was born in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii. Uh, he speaks broken English. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, he, he, he can speak good English, but you can tell there's an accent there. There's something, you sure. know, uh, my mom, he married a German and Irish woman. So my mom and her siblings are half Filipino, but you can tell there's, there's, you can kind of, I think there might be a mix there. So me, uh, I am, uh, just look like a white guy. <laughs> so for me, it's a way to stay in touch with my heritage. Yeah, you know, part of my heritage. Um, there's a lot, actually, a lot of Filipinos in the Beaumont community. The healthcare industry has recruited them for a lot of years. Actually, they work very well as RNs, physical therapists, doctors. Yeah, very intelligent. You know, good friend. Shout out to my friend, Dr. Joe Melbahar. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Um, he's a, a good friend of mine. He's the president of PABT. Okay. He and his wife own Live Well Physical Therapy on Dallin Road. Lou's is his wife. Um, anyways, great great people. So it's a way for me to stay in touch with my heritage, you know? Have you ever done like the Ancestry thing or the 23andMe? I haven't. That'd be interesting to do. Yeah. Um, uh, from Yeah, that'd be interesting to do. But I know my, I think one thing that I do know is on my dad's side, one of my great grandfathers, I don't know how many greats, but came as a refugee. The last name was Kudrain. Okay. I think there was an E on it, though. So it no, probably had it, some kind it, of French pronunciation. Yeah, okay, so that's fr- yeah. a French name. Yeah. Some kind of French pronunciation, yeah. I'm sure. It's, that, it sounds Cajun-ish. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Kudrains in Louisiana, yeah. too. So he came as a refugee. How, from, do, they, how do they pronounce it? Kudrain. Probably Kudrain. like Kudrain. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, they, he came as a refugee from World War I to Texas. Oh, wow. We actually have a picture of him. Rough looking, like looks like his, it looks like his face probably wore out three bodies. But uh, but you know, hey, you know, rough life back then. Yeah. So a refugee from World War One to Texas. That's that's the story. Uh-huh. I hope it's true. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but I, I I I would like to do one of those ancestry things. The coolest thing is that about about those is almost every you know Caucasian person there there's a a, pers- a, a small percentage in there that's African American mm-hmm. you know for every almost everybody because yeah. it, you know the world started over mm-hmm. there and that that's really cool to see that that we we're, we're really a mixture you know, modern oh, yeah. modern day humans are yeah. a mixture there there's you, you know almost don't really find there like, is really no one thing I, I, one of my professors in college said something that was I think it was really cool and makes sense he says there's really no such thing as black and white. Yeah. You know, well, black. Okay. Well, uh, there's a lot of mixtures there. There's a lot. You know, um, white. What does white mean? I mean, shoot. Uh, you you got somebody that probably looks like me that's full Irish or well, not full Irish. They probably have some blonde hair or red hair or whatever. But you know, there's a lot of people that look like me. 
Yeah, so and somewhere they would Euro- know that European. I'm 25. Yeah, I'm 25 percent Filipino. Some yeah. of my cousins in California that are one quarter Filipino, they have darker complexion than me, mm-hmm. but we're the same. So it's like, what is white? What are you Irish? Are you you know uh, Eastern European? Yeah. Um, there's really it really it's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. When I fill out a form for ethnicity, mm-hmm. if, if it's not a serious form, like if, if it's not government, if it's just something that I know isn't isn't too serious, uh, I check other and then I write in Spartan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I like to but, it's like the, somebody who's you know going through their day is very boring. They're looking all the, all these forms. Yeah, and they see <laughs> that's gonna be great. Because yeah, you know who are the Spartan? I, mean, I guess they're just Greek now. You know, it, it's they're, they're they're all gone. Yeah. Except, except for me, I'm the last one. <laughs> but <laughs> I I, the, the reason I haven't done one of those twenty three and me test yet, I, I think in the fine print, it's a like a government-funded DNA database. I think they have the government has access to it. Oh, me. interesting. I was, Which is I not thought, like something I'd have to worry about. I just don't yeah. like the idea. Of I it. thought, I was wondering, you know, the 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 Mormons in Utah mm-hmm. also have the, a vast database. And in fact, I think some of the, some of the, those type of things where you can trace back mm-hmm. actually are sourced through the Mormon database. They have this, these mainframes or something in a big cave uh, they do it. There's a, you can look up why they do it, but mm-hmm. uh, they've kept so many records for so long, and uh, a lot of that stuff is sourced through their database. Just about themselves, right? No, or, everybody. Oh, okay. they they buy it. They sort. I, I uh, that's so that's actually pretty cool that somebody's done that. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there's they, there's a lot of government that does that too. I guess, mm-hmm. but um, uh. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I need to do that one day. But yeah, speaking of government, something that we got to do cool together uh, just a couple of weeks ago is we got to meet Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Uh, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Um, you know, even though, you know, whenever I encounter a, a politician or anything like that, I try to keep the the mindset of, um, I don't want to be wowed by them because they're our employee. Right. You know, we're going to, it's because it's easy to be, you know, the, the, oh my gosh, it's pretty cool. And then, then, then yeah. like we have this whole culture in Washington of there are our overlords, call, you know, yeah, they're, they're uh, interviewed. But like, a the, lot of people get starstruck. Yeah, starstruck. So I try not to do that. But, but a guy like Dan Crenshaw, there's a little bit more gravitas there to him because he's not just a politician. Right. This guy, major respect to this guy. I mean, not only a service in the mil- served in the military, but a Navy SEAL basically put through some of the most harshest, most stressful, dangerous ever things in the world. Yeah. And if you're listening and you're not familiar with Dan Crenshaw, he's the 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 congressman in Texas that has the eye patch. And the reason he has the eye patch is because he lost his eye uh, over in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I was I, the main thing I was impressed by was his, his intelligence level, which is yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard is common among Navy SEALs. You know, they're already physical specimens, but most of them are geniuses. You know, because of you know, problem solving and things that and you know they do have guys that their main job is to kick doors down and they're you know they're the brute strengths, but they have you know demolition experts. They have yeah. expert snipers. Uh, yeah, mo- they're not somebody you want to encounter on on the wrong side of. No, for but sure. the, you're you're right. He um, what I appreciate about Dan, and it'd be really interesting to follow him throughout his um, you know sit, uh, his career in Washington. There, um, he I appreciate that when he talks. There's a lot more uh, depth of there's substance there. Mm-hmm. there. He's not saying a lot of the same colloquialisms or the same, you know, tired, worn out phrases you hear from a lot of politicians. Yeah. There you seems can, you to be a tell, frame of reference. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I even mentioned that day we were there. I said, I said, you know, there's a lot of politicians that give speeches at events we go to. A lot of them pander. They tell a corny joke. You hear the same thing over and over. That's not what you're going to hear today. Yeah, you know what? I, what impresses me is is he's um, he's coming from a frame a frame of of uh, reference of a philosophy of government, right? You know, it's like it's not just um, you know talk. There's a he's talking deeper than most politicians go. Philosophy of government. You know, Rand Paul. He he talks a lot like that too. Now, I'm not saying I'm the the um, the biggest supporter of Rand Paul. I'm just saying I appreciate when somebody thinks about ideas. Concepts, meta narratives, more than, uh, oh my, oh my gosh, those Democrats are bad. Just they're, look how bad they are, you know. Or those Republicans, they're just so bad about this. And and the, if they talk about big ideas, concepts, um, that uh, perks my ears up a little bit more. So I, I think I can take this person a little bit more serious. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> that's pretty cool. That's, that's a privilege uh, to see him. Um, one thing I. I uh, I'll probably throw out a few things that 
have helped me personally. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, and in hopes that maybe they can be of service to somebody else, help them, somebody else, you know? Yeah. You may disagree with what I have to say, but something's helped me. Um, I'm a happy guy. Love life. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I had almost somewhat of a little bit of epiphany, like probably, I think, 20 years old. I can remember where I was. Uh, I was driving on 327, headed to my house in Silsby. <laughs> I was in my truck, still in college, you know? Yeah. And um, one thing that has been pivotal in my life is this idea of contentment. Um, you know, we, we're born, and it's, some of us grow up, we're, we're always thinking, okay, I can, I'll be happy and satisfied when I achieve this or when I achieve that. Well, one thing that uh, I'd, I'd heard it, you know, talked about before, but it, it really just connected with me is, is Paul in the Bible talks about be content with where you are right now. Mm-hmm. Learn how to be content with what you have right now. And be in my, you know, bear in mind, this is a guy who wrote most of the New Testament from prison, a prison cell. Right. <laughs> if exactly. he can learn to be yeah. content with what he has, basically with nothing, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I can learn to be content living in the greatest country in the world and the greatest time to be alive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, essentially, if you're born in America, you've won the birth lottery. So Yeah, I think if, if you make, uh, what is it, like a mid-$30,000 a year, you're in the 1% of the world. I can uh, believe that. Yeah. I can believe that. So so when I, I was like, okay, I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be content with my place in life and what I have right now not wait to be happy until I achieve this or this or this. Now, there's nothing wrong with striving to advance your career, striving to make more money, striving to get a bigger house, whatever. But if that is your goal, your main goal, if that's the end, it's never going to be enough. Mm -hmm. If it's, oh, I'll be happier with a bigger house. I'll be happier with uh, a better car or if I make more money. Or I'll be happier with a uh, a better spouse, you know. (laughs) Um, You'll never be happy. You'll always be, oh, I'm not satisfied yet. So, so what that was a for me, that's been a pivotal thing in my life mm-hmm. is learn how to be content right now. Sure. You know, if if nothing ever now you you strive to get better, of course. Right. But um that's not your main goal. Yeah. You know, the main goal is not to make more money. When somebody gets to the end of their life, mm-hmm. they never say, Gee, I wish I made more money. Gee, I wish I spent more time at the office. Right. No, they say I wish I spent more time with my family mm-hmm. and my friends. I heard somebody say um, one time, if a man has good friends, good relationships with his friends, good relationships with his family, he's rich. Sure. So just consider yourself rich right now. You know, that's been something, I don't know, maybe that can help uh, other people, uh, but that's been something that's helped me. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective and uh, a great way to, you know, put things in, in in the outlook of your life for for where you are now. Mm-hmm. Sure. The um I just, uh I, I'm big about uh reading books, mm-hmm. you know. I used to hate reading when I was a kid, but I'm big about reading books because there's some things that you can only learn through a book. Right. There's no documentary you can watch, there's nothing on and there's not a YouTube video. It's only through a book. Well, my challenge has always been I'm probably one of the slowest readers in the world. I really have to work to read. It's, yeah. um, you know, so audiobooks is what I do. Okay. Yeah. And, I'm in the same boat there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with my, with my job, I drive a lot in my truck. So I just have that pick up where I left off from my last book. And I, I've, believe it or not, I've read three books in the last three weeks. Oh, wow. That's a thought, really good pace. When I was, somebody told me I could do that when I was like in high school, I'd be like, oh, you're crazy. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, driving probably ends up being a lot of your free time and you can't read during your driving. Yeah. Time, so you might as well make the most of it with the. Yeah. Audio. So I, I encourage you, if you haven't read this book, it's an old book. It's been out for a while, probably since 2003, I think. But it's called The Purpose Driven Life. I haven't read the sequels to it. I just read that one in 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, that was also a pivotal. Uh, thing for me because it basic. I don't know if you're familiar with the book. I've heard of it. Well, I was. I read it as a chore because I was told to read it. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I read it. And I was like, oh, you know what? This is some really good stuff in this book. Basically, to sum it down, it addresses. <laughs> uh, let's just go into the the biggest, toughest questions in the world. What's the meaning of life? Mm-hmm. You know. And essentially, my worldview of the meaning of life. What's helped me a good part from that book is. We were created for relationship, relationship with God and a relationship with each other. Mm-hmm. That's the meaning of life. Um, and 
uh, a lot of people look for, well, what's my purpose in life? What's my, what's my specific purpose? Well, some people work too hard trying to find just one specific purpose. For me, it's very simple. Jesus talks about, you know, treating the least of these with respect, treating them, taking care of the the widows, the orphans. He said, if you do these things to them, it's mm-hmm. like you've done it to me. Right. That's the purpose. That's our big purpose is are we, we need to treat other people, uh, love God and love our se- love our neighbor as ourself. Right. And so it's a lot of people can maybe take a break from worrying about trying to, you know, in that you make a life and you do what you can. <laughs> but, right, right. but, um, but basically that's, that helped me. And then, of course, people are going to say, why does, e- okay, if, why does evil exist in the world? Well, my world, you don't have to agree with it. My worldview is God didn't create the world with all the evils in it. He created the world perfect. When he created the world, he, he talked to Adam and Eve. They had a complete relationship. Well, when sin entered into the world, that severed that. And all, so God, I don't believe God gives can- cancer to people. Mm-hmm. I don't believe God has all this. <laughs> but, but he didn't leave us where we were. Uh, the basic story of the Bible is, if you had to sum it down to one thing, is God restoring the relationship between humankind and him. Right. That's the basic arc from the covenant with Abraham to Jesus, et cetera. So those two things, some of the biggest, some of the biggest questions and toughest questions out there, what is the meaning of life Mm -hmm. and why does evil exist in the world? Um, like I said, it, it does exist, but he didn't leave us there. He took the initiative to restore the relationship. And eventually, all is going to make, be made right. So those concepts have allowed, really, for me, that and the, the idea of contentment mm-hmm. ha- really allow me to enjoy life now. Like life is meaningful. Life has purpose. Um, that's probably one of the most impactful ideas on me, and maybe that helps somebody out there. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> it, it it lets people know that they're in they're in control of their consequences, you know, good or bad. Uh, yeah. At, at, at some level, you can be in control of that. Well, what somebody... Be, because of choice. Yeah. Right? Now, uh, I listen, to, I, I get a lot of great things from a lot of people I, I listen to. That uh, um, It's just, you can't, it never hurts to listen to people that are really sm- way smarter than you. And there's a lot of people out there that are way smarter than us. Oh, I agree. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's one, all you know, I try to do. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, there's, I'm not, there's people out there born into really tough situations. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, all the decks, all the cards in the deck are stacked against them. Yeah, and they were, they were dealt a bad yeah. hand out of the bad cards. But the actions you take can change your situation. You either can say, okay, there's nothing I can do about this, and, it, it, you know, uh, I can never be better than this. So, I, Or you can say, what can I do to learn and make decisions to advance? You know, if I was born... Uh, into um, a situation where, you know, my parents were addicted to crack. I was in the inner city. I would be doing the same stuff as most kids that grow up. That's that's all they know, that, that you know, that there's a perpetuation of crime that mm-hmm. that goes on. I'd be doing the same thing if I was born in that situation. The, 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 what we have to do as a broader society, I think, is we have to start rebuilding the social fabric of our communities and stop that perpetual... Um, a chain of failure because yeah. those kids don't have a chance. We have to stop that perpetual chain of failure, rebuild our communities, um, and and uh, if we're going to have a positive effect on on those situations, the people that weren't born into a, a two parent household like I was. Right. I mean, I had two parents growing up. I mean, they they divorced when I was twenty, but you know, most pretty much growing up, I had yeah. two parents. Um. Uh. So I, what I try to do is I try to be a good steward of the what I've been blessed with. Now we were lower, we weren't, we were, weren't quite middle class, we were lower middle class, mm-hmm. um, but still lower middle class in the United States is really great. Yeah, and in a rural community like Silsby, it's probably the majority. Yeah, mm-hmm. So um, I don't, I try, I think, I think it's my job as a Christian and my job as somebody who's been, uh, court, you know, compared to the rest of the world, very blessed. If you're, if you're a middle class in America, you're very blessed. Yeah. So I think it's my duty to think about people that are in the worst situations in the world. Yeah. Uh, not not just across the oceans, but here too. I think it's my duty to think and really f- try to find solutions on how um, I can be a part, uh, maybe a, a piece or a cog in the bigger thing that's going to 
make those people's lives better or, you know, so I think we, we need to be thinking about the people in the worst situations in the world. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the United States, I guess, tries to help the world as much as they can. Do you think that they should scale back foreign aid and get into those places in America that we talked about? Like where there's, you know, uh, there's places in Chicago or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Virginia coal miners that are laid off and, and it's like generational poverty. Uh, yeah, I, it's um, kind of a battle of who, you know, as, as from a humanitarian, uh, yeah. standpoint, you should help humans, not just Americans, but mm -hmm. it seems like maybe we're overreaching problems in our neighborhood to go help uh, another country. That's a good point. You know, there's, um, it's, it, and there's also when it co comes to other countries, it's probably case by case situations. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you got something like where the world definitely failed the genocide and, uh, is it Rwanda or, mm -hmm. you know, is it, I remember when I was in college that was going on anyways, but there's also situations where we're doing things right now out of good intent, but it's kind of messing with the situation. Mm -hmm. I was listening to people talk about specific countries in Africa can't remember the specific country they were talking about, but let me just give you the example. We send T-shirts and clothes over to these countries thinking we're helping them. Well, the problem is that is undercutting the market getting rebuilt in those systems. There are people there with businesses with textile production that are making clothes and stuff like that. Uh, they can't sell them because we're bringing, all this free stuff yeah. coming in and undercutting, and so that that – that market can't develop. Mm. And they're like, please stop, stop with the free shirts. Yeah, you know? so I guess like it would be better to help those businesses, you know, maybe with their production yeah. well, or, um, or some way to stimulate the economy, I guess, would be. Bono with U2. U2. Yeah, U2. I want to say YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Bono with U2. Uh, U2 speaks better on this than I am. Mm -hmm. um, he talks, because he's, you know, he's, he's spent time in Africa trying right. to do a lot of good things. I think, from what I can tell, Bono is coming from a really good place in his heart. Uh, we may disagree politically, but there's a lot of shared values there. Mm -hmm. And I, I like what he said about um, entrepreneurial capitalism has raised more people out of poverty than anything else in human history. And I think in the last 50, 20 to 30 years, we've reduced by a massive percentage people in the poverty. There's there's less people in poverty today than any time in human history. And think about this. There's more people living on the planet right now at one yeah. time. There's 7 billion people on the planet living right. at one time. And lowest amount of poverty. And we have record employment globally. Right. So there are more people working at one time than ever, ever in human history. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurial capitalism, along with moral sentiments, you know, mm -hmm. did that. You know, uh, uh, John, uh, John, John Adams that wrote, and now I'm getting this wrong on the guy. Anyway, the, the gentleman who wrote um, uh, Moral Sentiments, he also wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations. Okay. Uh, so I'm not getting the wrong, wrong founding father. Anyways, he wrote Wealth of Nations. People a lot of times focus on the wealth of nations, especially Republicans. And I come from a conservative, just to let you know, I come from a conservative background. I uh, was hardcore Republican in high school and college. I've, I've since become more libertarian, mm -hmm. I'm more small government. You know, anyways, um, a lot of people focus on the wealth, the book Wealth of Nations and capitalism and everything. Well, they forget that that author also wrote Moral Sentiments. You have to have both, you know. So anyways, but but both, that is what um, rose more people out of poverty than any other thing in the world. So we need to focus on what are things are actually working in these African countries mm -hmm. and what things are maybe not working, all, no matter how uh, well-intentioned they are. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot more better people that can speak on that specifically than me, but I found that pretty interesting. Yeah, because I, I think even though that <laughs> Capitalism may not be perfect. It seems to be better than other systems. Yeah, uh, entrepreneurial capitalism paired with moral sentiments. I don't. I quite honestly, I don't think we've been practicing um, capitalism for the past probably ninety to a hundred years. A lot of people, uh, and this is also something that I, I also feel is important. Um, Democrats. Uh, I heard somebody say Democrats are from Venus and, and, and Republicans are from Mars. Kind of still yeah. in that thing, like a, the you know men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You know, right, right. Um, we speak two different languages sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and we need to. Oh, this makes sense when I finish my thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we need to um, 
actively befriend people that are opposite us politically and listen to them, listen to their point of view, because when you do that, you realize we speak two different languages. When I, to, to, to maybe some Democrats, some very left people, when I say ca- I'm talking about capitalism, their, um, uh, their idea of what capitalism is, that word to them probably denotes or can, connotes a different idea in their brain than it does for me. Um, uh, they're, they, they think they look at capitalism and they're, and they're just thinking, well, my gosh, look at the, the big greedy banks, how they're screwing people. And well, yeah, there is a lot of big industry and big corporations that are screwing people. Whenever you have big business colluding with government to get special advantages mm-hmm. to shut out their competition, that's not, that's crony capitalism. That's right. not capitalism. Capitalism is supposed to be a level playing field along with a moral people. Uh, I think what John Adams said, our form of government will work for a moral and religious people. It will, self-government will not work for any other. Well, that's also been something that's the social fabric of America over the past 100 years has started to whittle away. When that whittles away, self-government doesn't work as well anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when we're not preferring our neighbor above ourself, you know, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to steal from them. Right. As a, <laughs> there's a podcast I think you, you, people out there should really listen to. Phil Robinson from Duck Dynasty. Mm-hmm. He just did a podcast with Glenn Beck, I think, last weekend. Oh, okay. Um, listen to that podcast. There's yeah. a lot of depth to Phil Robinson that you're not going to, you never realized was there. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting one. He, this guy's got a, a master's degree, by the way. People don't realize that. But one thing he said was if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from him. Right. You're not going to mess with this woman. Mm hmm. You're not going to do them unjustly because you love them. Right. We're so disjointed in America today. We're so compartmentalized. You know, this this uh, uh, culture of anonymity. We can be anonymous online. Mm-hmm. We can say whatever we want to people that we wouldn't say to their face. Yeah, if you look in the comments section, <laughs> you know, there's— uh, It's a dumpster fire. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I stopped reading comments of a lot of things. It drives me crazy. You know, and some of the people that do the negative comments every single day— you. you you just you don't find a lot of people that are winners in the comment section. You, yeah. know, you take some of the most powerful influencers of positivity; they're not in the comment section. You know? <laughs> and we sometimes there's a temptation uh, that we are um, our, our worst selves when we're anonymous. You mm-hmm. know, I think when I heard somebody say one reason why road rage is a thing is they don't pull over. And, well. Yeah. You're anonymous in a right. vehicle. Yeah, yeah. If I think if we had to put on the back of everybody's vehicle their name, their place of worship, uh, maybe would pe- people there wouldn't be so much road rage because you're in a vehicle. The road rage, you're you're screaming at somebody, and the, you know your passenger's like, "What the heck?" Yeah. Well, you you know that they can't see you. They can't tell who you are. Right. So I thought that was like, you know what? That's kind of similar to social media. Yeah, that's exactly right. Very good comparison. <laughs> I can't yeah. remember who was saying that. I'd like to give him credit, but yeah. I can't remember who was saying that. But um, uh, I can't remember I was going to go with this. By the way, people, uh, I like talking to people, big groups, meeting groups, small, medium-sized groups, small groups, one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Fine with that. Being recorded. Freaking me out a little bit. So it's your <laughs> fault. All you people out there in podcast world, you're freaking me out. So if if, if, if I'm rambling, it's your fault. No, yeah. I'm just picking. <laughs> yeah, what I've learned is you just have to pretend like it's a conversation. And, yeah. And you just know that people are going to hear it later. So <laughs> There you go. You know, the, yeah. Um, the fact that it's recorded, it's like, oh, it seems unfor- uh, it's, it's going to be unforgiving. But... I like recorded better because live would freak me out. Interesting. I, interesting. I don't think yeah. I could do live. I can do short snippets live, uh-huh. but, uh, you know, a, a long form discussion live. I don't know. I don't think I could do. That. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think what I was saying is is um, uh, we're so the problem in America is not disagreement. Mm-hmm. I I just I'm almost finished reading Arthur Brooks's. Uh, I'm like got 15 minutes left on the audio book. Arthur Brooks's book just came out. Love your enemies. Get that book and read it. Whether no, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, whatever. Get that book and read it. One thing he talks about is. Um, uh, we're so disjointed. The problem in America is not disagreement. It's contempt. Mm-hmm. Um, sp- spouses with wonderful marriages, they have disagreements. Uh, he said one of his friends is a therapist, and that therapist said he can, in one session sitting down with a couple that's having problems, he can predict with 95% accuracy 
if that couple is going to be divorced within three years. Oh, and the, wow. what it is is signs of contempt. Mm. Are they rolling their eyes at their spouse? Yeah. Do they have contempt for them? So in the America, we have you know the outrage industrial complex that you see coming from CNN, coming from Fox News, coming from major media. Yeah. They're making a ton of money off of us all being divided, mm-hmm. us driving up contempt against the other side. Well, um, the reason why I think it's important to befriend, actively seek out somebody that is different from you politically, mm-hmm. opposite. Befriend them with no ulterior motive, no agenda. It's not, oh, I'm going to befriend them so I can win them over to my view. No. Befriend them, even even though you know they may not come over to your views, w- try to understand them. Mm-hmm. Listen and not listen. Oh, I got to remember that so I can I can uh, rebut that with my points. No, right. Listen. They're going to listen to you too. You're going to learn about one another. You're going to realize, you know what? We have more principles and values in common. Mm-hmm. We may disagree on the solutions on how to to fix the problems, but we kind of want the same thing. Um, we have a lot more in common. If we only listen to the outrage media, yeah, I call on both it, sides, uh, recreational outrage. Oh, that's is, a good one. That's yeah. a good. That's a good phrase. If we only listen to them, it's gonna seem like we're in a cold civil war, and there's no turning. There's no fixing this. Mm-hmm. No, there is fixing this, but it's the solution. My opinion, it's not gonna come from Washington. It's not gonna come from a politician. I think our politicians, Washington, are a reflection of us. Uh, one thing Arthur Brooks talks about in his book is um, change starts with you. I'm going to declare my independence from the outrage culture. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to hate the people that are opposite me. Uh, I'm not going to have contempt for them. If I get to know the people in my community that are different from me, it's a lot harder to have contempt for them if I know them. You know, right. get to know them, and uh, that's what's going to solve the major divide, the major um, powder keg that a lot of people, you know, we feel we're sitting on. Yeah, and there's always so many ways to find common ground that people don't realize. Um, you know, these people that you have differences with politically, uh, you may enjoy playing Xbox together. You may both like Bluebell ice cream. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it was shown on SNL, actually, of all platforms was when tom hanks was a guest on what they called black jeopardy and he he had a (laughs) i've seen us i've seen that clip i think yeah so he's he's dressed up in a maga hat Mm -hmm. you know and kind of like a uh they dressed him up like a poor white man (laughs) and and he's and he's on black jeopardy with a black host and black contestants and they're asking questions that are would be only answered what they thought by black people and he just wins all the answers because <laughs> he shows that we really have, we really like the same things. You know, they ask a question about uh, like the Medea movies, mm-hmm. you know, and he chimes right in and they're like, <laughs> how'd you know? He's like, oh, I got the whole box set at Walmart. It'll make you laugh and cry. I gotta, I gotta watch that again. Yeah. And it goes on, you know, they, they ask something about uh, the government. He's like, oh no, you can't trust the government. And they're like, yeah. You know, and and it, <laughs> But it just shows how you know, we, we all like the same stuff. Um, they they were trying to pin a corner on you know the rapper Lil Wayne on racism. He said all my concerts are full of white people. That's a powerful it, clip. It, that that Lil Wayne clip. Have you also seen the one where he's talking about the white police officer that saved his life when he was a kid? I, I think I've heard of that one. I I need to go back and. That's amazing. That's an amazing. Uh, and you know, every generation get seems to get less and less racist. Um, I was yeah. watching The Greatest Showman with my kids, mm-hmm. and it, it has a, a a part there where there's a stigma of a, a rich white guy, and he's with Zendaya. It's, it's Zac Efron and Zendaya, mm-hmm. and he's interested in her, you know, uh, and wants to take her to the theater as a date. And his parents see him, and they're just appalled. They said, "You can't hang out with that, you know, that kind. You can't, uh, you can't." hang out with the help. Mm. And, you know, she cries mm. and runs away. And my kids, like, totally did not understand. what They were like, well, why can't they hang out? And I was like, well, this was a long time ago. You know, this was back in, uh, it was like the 1800s or mm-hmm. 19, 1900s, you know, Barnum and Bailey mm-hmm. Circus. And 
I kind of had I had to explain what was going on because they didn't get it. You know, they they have friends of all colors and they don't really see that as much as maybe a previous uh, or a, an yeah. older generation. And so I I think we're we're definitely more tolerant now than we were 50 years ago and I think we'll be more tolerant 50 years from now. Yeah, uh I hope so. Um even though there are forces that want to tear us apart. Yeah, whereas someone already, we watched that show, we don't have a question. We're like, oh yeah, yeah. they were all racist back then. And we know what's going on. Yeah. And, and whereas, you know, you have a lot of kids that watch that show because uh, it was a great movie and they, they like didn't, a, they didn't, they didn't intuitively understand yeah. what was going on because they didn't put two and two together because they didn't grow up in, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whereas our, our parents or grandparents may have grown up in a divided schools or, you know, racial mm -hmm. conflicts. And then we grew up you know, being friends with all walks of life a little bit better than the previous generation. Yeah. Um, that's a good sign. Yeah. I, 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 I want, uh, I want, you know, I think it's a good sign that there's more mixed marriages mm -hmm. like us. Um, uh, I think that's, uh, I, th I know that one time that that, that was a, like a, oh my gosh, yeah, a it stigma. Was a stigma right? It's like, mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's less and less becoming a stigma. Yeah. You know? And, it, and it's hard for it to become a stigma when you, you know, you say, uh, well, only this race should marry this race, but you didn't, you do the DNA test and you, well, I have, yeah. I have, I have part of that other race. So what, what's the point of, yeah. And I also don't think that the government should be involved in marriage because it's, I agree. I, I know you need the official, I guess, recognition, you know, because you need a, uh, you can't just put your friend on your health insurance. You, you know, it needs to be a legitimate spouse. Yeah, but. yeah. I, I think there's ways of of sorting that out, though. Mm -hmm. Without, um, you know, the <laughs> the uh, the because the, when you boil it all down, you're you're asking the government permission to cohabitate yeah. with another human. And think, it doesn't seem I, like something they should. Yeah, be involved I think in. I think the government should be out of marriage completely. Yeah, and they usually always were. Uh, so from what I can understand from the 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 history that I've studied. Um, the government only started being in, involved in marriage with marriage certificates and licenses and stuff. And the, the reason fee. was to keep to keep blacks from marrying whites. It could have been, yeah. That's the that's the story that I've 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 kind of heard from some some people that I I think yeah. I trust their sources. Right, right. And so like it, it was more of a that was the only reason. I th and I think it was what I'm, I'm thinking it was the, around the 40s or so. But yeah. it was it, I don't think the government should be involved in marriage. You know, marriage is an institution by God. Get married in your church. Mm -hmm. If you got a church that can, you know, uh, uh, whatever the situation is, get married in your church. Mm -hmm. um, that's there's really no need for a government situation because if one thing, one reason I think the government should be out of marriage is because, um, why should anybody be telling you what you should do personally? If they can tell, if they can tell gay people that they can't be married. Mm -hmm. um, then who's to say somebody else has the power and they can maybe make it harder on straight people or they can make religious organizations say you have to do this or do that. How about the government's not telling anybody yeah, because it's what always, to do? It, it changes with who's in charge. Yeah. Uh, sometimes. So like, I, and I'm then fine. If you, if you break up, you have to go to the government again and you have to yeah. use the government's help uh, to break up from someone, <laughs> you can't even. Get, yeah, I think which, it's a. I think it's a useless political football that um ha was used for a lot of years to uh you know ra rally each base. Mm -hmm. It was just a useless political football the whole time. Yeah, I uh, you know, I think. Yeah, well, tell me about the little uh, doohickey that you brought. Oh yeah, so uh, a friend of mine, uh, shout out to you, uh, David DeRogier good guy. A lot of people probably know him. Anyways, we were hanging out at the grill yesterday and, uh, you know, you get that friend, that family member who's like, oh yeah, I've been trying, I, I know I'll do it. I'll do it. I when I get around to it, I'm going to get around to it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I haven't done it yet, but I promise you I'm going to get around to it. Well, um, this is, this is around to it. <laughs> you got one. You, you give it to me and say, oh good. I'm so glad you're going to do it when you get around to it. Here you go. That's yeah. around to it. You can do it now. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was cool. Uh, that's uh, ohaneweb.com, web design and hosting. Yeah. So if you're just listening, he, it's, it's a, a wooden coin and it says to it, T-U-I-T. -T, and it's obviously it's round. So uh, <laughs> It's around to you it. Can, you can physically hand someone around to it and say, you know, 
G Y S T. Hey, David Dorje, you're a fun guy to hang out. Thanks for giving me one of those, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great patio at the grill. Uh, you know, after work. Love that live, place, man. Live music. I love that mm-hmm. place. It's so relaxing. Um, uh, one night we were there with uh, um, is it Kyle Barnes? Yeah, Kyle Barnes, the DJ. Yeah, so high. And DJs. Uh, he hooked his uh, he hooked his 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 laptop and he had his cell phone and stuff hooked into their television, their sound system. We were watching the Astros game. In between the commercials, he'd play some DJ stuff on his phone. Yeah, it was fun, man. Yeah, Kyle's <laughs> a super interesting guy. I, I think he's the only person in Southeast Texas that has a legitimate boring company, not a flamethrower, which is the Elon Musk flamethrower that he you, has one. He's yeah, the guy that has one. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> that, so I took a picture with it. You've probably seen it. I saw um, that. Yeah. I was wondering yeah, who had un- that. Unfortunately, it's not mine. I wish it was. Uh, I, and you know, there was a limited v- amount of those that you could get from Elon Musk. He only made a, a certain number. The, there were $500 and he used it to fund the boring company, which was not boring as in <laughs> yeah. interesting, but boring as <laughs> drilling holes under the ground. Of that, Los Angeles. That to story is hilarious. Shoot uh, cars through. They they started with the hat, and then they moved on to the not a flame. It's called not a flamethrower because you can't legally, uh, you know, mail a flamethrower <laughs> through the mail or or transact it. So it's it's called in a joking way not a flamethrower, and it's it's actually a a roofing torch. You know, a propane roofing torch with an yeah. air rifle cover put into the body of an air rifle. Right, and it says it. So. Um, <laughs> Look at the clip, by the way. If you haven't watched it, look at the clip with Elon Musk talking to Joe Rogan. You can just find that one clip, you know, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, flamethrower, where he's talking about it. It's hilarious. It's like he's, he says, he's he's like, yep, we made this thing, and I told people, don't buy it. Yeah. Not a good idea. <laughs> but they bought it anyway. They did. And obviously, if you say that, and the, his, the way he packaged it, he's probably sold hundreds of thousands, if not a million of them. And it's, yeah. he says, it literally says, not a flamethrower. Yeah. <laughs> Watch, that's hilarious. Oh, yeah. And he says he got the idea from the movie Spaceballs, where they're they're going through the, the merchandising. Uh, that's right, um, yeah. And, and yeah. there's a flamethrower, and it's, oh, the, the kids love it. And the, that's, that's what they say <laughs> the in the movie. The kids love it. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, but what what an interesting person. I must I must have uh, listened to and watched that podcast, uh, you know, at least five times. Yeah. So uh, he's um, he's so he's so deep. Like he, he's he's a brain that's obviously like genius level. Yeah. Like I thought my phone, you know, turned off, but it was him thinking before he responded to, <laughs> yeah, to, to some the of the boss. questions. Because you, usually it, it's which is the complete opposite to like mm-hmm. Joe Rogan and Alex Jones. It's just nonstop talking over each other. Sometimes. Yeah. And the Elon, you know, Joe would ask him a question and there would be a pause and I, I thought something happened. And, oh yeah, then, then he speaks. He's real methodical. And- One real compelling part of that discussion was he was, uh, I'm following AI, artificial intelligence, and yeah. AGI, artificial mm-hmm. general intelligence, ASI. Uh, it's very intriguing. You may think I'm crazy for bringing these things up, but there's a lot going on in technology that you have no idea. And I'm following the discussion. I'm, I'm following both sides of it, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, some people think it's not maybe such a big deal. Some people think it's a really big deal. But he he was talking about it and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And then they were talking about the subject of, you know, uh, with uh, with advances in technology, is it going to create massive unemployment? How mm-hmm. are we going to handle it? Right. There's uh, I know the um, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, the the um, you know, I can't remember the company that that put out the study. But they're, they're predicting. One, some people are predicting it could cause permanent 30% unemployment. Right. Do you think it'll be in our lifetime? I think it'll be after. So uh, I'm less um, uh, I'm less inclined to believe in the premise that it's actually going to happen at all. Here's why. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I'm following both sides, and I can see, you know, uh, how both sides have a point. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, Silicon Valley— are actively saying they're working on 100% employment that we, because we won't have to work right. 100% employment. Well, I definitely don't think that's ever going to happen. But they're they're saying you know we could possibly have 30% un, 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 perpetual unemployment. Well, that can cause a lot of upheaval in society. Our, and so people are talking about universal basic basic income. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be something that we're going to have to maybe have just to keep the peace or keep people from you know? Um, so that you know, it's a very compelling some ideas there. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, 
Arthur Brooks was uh, I was watching a podcast uh, had a couple a couple weeks ago. Arthur Brooks, um, he's he used to be the he's a professor at Harvard right now. He used to be the uh, the head or the president or whatever of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, longtime academic, uh, the, the major accomplished guy too. But in his bio, anyways, he said he somewhat disagrees with the the premise. Um, there are let's see, I put my notes here. He um, he said. Technical revolutions are just a difference in how we use inputs and outputs. Okay. He said, labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship, those are the only inputs into any production process in the whole economy and all of human history. Um, Not that there's not going to be an upheaval, but um, he said the way that these things work together, labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship – the change in how those relate to one another is a change in technology, whether it's a new idea, whether it's a new invention. You know, obviously, the Industrial Revolution was a major change in technology. Right. Um, and he, he said, when you think about it, every job is basically 22 to 25 things mm-hmm. that people need expertise, they have expertise in. What a technical re- uh, technology revolution does is it takes your 25 you know, 22, 25 things, rips them apart. It puts them into a big box with everybody else's 22 to 25 different things, shakes them all up, and then spits them out in different collections of 22 to 25 things. Right. Uh, He said, he made a comment that, um, you know, people think, oh, robots, are those going to replace a lot of things? Well, um, so he he said, well, you're you're talking about a, a substitution of labor for capital. Or capital, for, you know. It, you know right, he said, yeah. um, and he said, you know, in the industrial revolution, that was a big worry. Are things going to replace laborers? Processes and you know, assembly lines are going to replace laborers. He said, actually, we needed more laborers. Mm. We didn't exactly stay static or, or lose labor. We actually needed more laborers. That's the miracle of entrepreneurial capitalism is the pie gets bigger. Ah, it's not man. a pie that there are only so many pieces and we have to figure out how to redistribute the pie. The pie gets bigger. Right. And so I was like, well, you know, that's a good point. There are all, there have always been uh it's it's a creative and destructive process. Right. Um and there are jobs now that were created because of technology that we would have never dreamed of before. Sure. And he said, so there will be new jobs created that we don't know, we can't conceive of right now. Not that it might be a ten-year process of upheaval, and uh, but I think he said I think the the thing is uh, it would be less of a challenge if if we had a more entrepreneurial society. It would be less of a challenge, you know. Right. Um, training people, maybe people only know how to do eight of the new twenty-two things they're going to need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that, that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, uh, but there, I think there's a lot of weight to that part of the discussion. I don't know that I'm settled either way. Yeah. But I think that I'm following both sides of the discussion. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. With the universal basic income, you know, the, the theory behind that is people would be able to do the things they enjoy and not have to worry about working 40 hours a week, working a second job. But it seems like you have a small experiment of that now in the welfare system, you know, the, uh, especially people with generational welfare that are are trying to work the system so they don't have to get a job. You know, they, they're not doing things they enjoy. They're not – well, because they you always hear the politicians say un, universal basic, basic income would increase the arts. And, you know, people could do poetry mm-hmm. and, and – Oh, they'll, uh, have, art, they'll have time. Oh, they'll have time just because they don't have to work for a living. They'll have right. time to – Write poetry and stuff. But people that receive the welfare, they're not doing those things. They're- and also somebody on disability. Right. They're not able to work. They're on disability. Who do you know that's on disability that's making amazing poetry, that's doing amazing art? They're st- they're kind of worried about, well, gee, I, I mean, it's not. Ba- I'm not back to where I was. Right, yeah. And I'm sure there's outliers, but as a whole— uh, yeah, Especially it, when you're thinking about talking about a thousand dollars a month, because yeah. I know oh, Yang, one of the presidential, co- yeah. what's his full name? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, he's the one that wanted to just yeah. give everyone a thousand. And he's uh, that's that's the figure he settled on. Because a lot right. of people think, oh, universal basic basic income. Oh yeah, well, what what's the figure? Mm-hmm. He put the figure at a thousand dollars a month. Well, a thousand dollars a month. It's it's just a bonus. Are um, you going to be sitting around 
loving po- putting out an amazing poetry and 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 you dabbling in the arts, yeah. making a thousand dollars a month, you're probably gonna be like, "Holy crap, uh, this doesn't gonna pay all my bills." No, it's not gonna be sustainable at all. You know, twelve thousand a year, try to live off that. Uh, you know, I think. Yeah, I'm not saying we shouldn't have the discussion. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I, I try to not come from a place of, oh, you're stupid. That's a dumb idea. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah. I'm okay discussing even the things that I disagree with. We can still discuss them because I'm always open to the possibility that maybe I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm always open to the possibility that I think maybe I can learn more. And you know, so I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and that that's what I try to do. I try to listen to, you know, see what I can learn from both sides of the the aisle or both sides of the argument and try to make the best decision for myself that's common sense. Uh, well, you know, my friend and I, Ross Gibbs, shout out Ross Gibbs, love you, brother. Uh, he and I have much better discussions than we used to in high school. He was from hardcore Democrat. I was from a hardcore Republican. And man, we would, the discussions would not go well when we talked about politics. We actually have very good discussions now because we change the way and what we talk about. Do you think the two of you have slid more to moderate? And, yeah. And that you're, you know, you started over here, he started over there. And do you think you're coming closer to the middle, like more of a centrist? <laughs> yeah. And you know why we've, I think why we've both moved, we've, we've both um, decided it's an humble thing that you, you say, okay, you know what? I'm open to the fact that maybe what I believe in is wrong. The mm-hmm. facts, my set of facts, maybe they're wrong. I'm going to be open to the fact that maybe I'm wrong on some issues. Once you're open to that, we then we started talking about um, ideas. You know, the, the, I know the, the, the saying goes, small people talk about, or small minds talk about people. Average minds talk about events. Above average minds talk about ideas. So we started talking about principles and values. And we came to realize, you know what? We have a lot of the shared principles and values. We may disagree on how to get there. And and we our discussions ha- have really changed. We actually find more in common than we do that divide that separates us because we change the discussion. Yeah. And if y'all are similar in age probably to myself, I think I think that we're the generation that's becoming more moderate and more logical uh mm-hmm. you know Dan Crenshaw who's two years younger than me, actually, uh, seems to look at each issue with common sense. You know, he still makes a, a firm stance that he he's conservative and, you know, obviously Republican. But, you know, I consider myself more moderate and looking at things just, do they make sense? You know, is like, for example, the, the Green New Deal, you know, like there's parts of the deal that don't make sense. Obviously, I'm a Republican that likes solar. I got solar panels on my house. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a hybrid car. But the Green New Deal banned nuclear, which is one of the cleanest energies that that's really, really efficient. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it it does have the stigma of causing disasters, but it doesn't produce any any carbon footprint really. And so it didn't really make sense that that the Green New Deal would ban that large amount of green energy. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I hear, and, and kind of what you're saying is you, you, are you examine every issue by itself, and okay. you you wait, you know, that comes from a idea of a, 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 an attitude of, um, I'm gonna examine the issue, and if I'm wrong, I'll change my mind. Yeah, we've got to figure out a way to harness the sun. I think uh, beyond solar. I think it's going to be something, something. Well, it's going to be hard to harness that sun, Tyler, because it's 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 circling the Earth. It's circling the Earth so oh, okay. fast. It's revolving around <laughs> this flat Earth so fast. We got to find a way to to harness that. <laughs> stop it from moving so fast, Tyler. I've got to figure out um, <laughs> if there's any legitimate flat Earthers around here that I can get on the show. There's there's got to be one. I think if you put it out there, they'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, maybe I could get the flat Earther. You know, the the, the guy Mark. Have you seen the the flat the, earth. Have you seen the documentary on Netflix yet? No, I've heard of it. The, the biggest name flat earther I know is Joey Bravo. Wait, wait well, oh, Eddie, that, Eddie, Eddie Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, and and that he's that's more of a but I, uh, entertainment value. The, there's these are the guys that are going to the conventions and they, that kind of started the revolution. Okay. Uh, but the coolest thing about the documentary was there was this big experiment that they thought was going to be the nail in the coffin, 
where they they set people they're like miles apart. He got a like a high powered laser, and he's at this point, and he, he measured somebody that's like a certain mileage away where the Earth would supposed to be curved, mm-hmm. and shined the light into this hole. And he's on the radio to this guy, and he's like, uh, "If the Earth is flat, you're gonna see the laser shine through this hole. Um, if the Earth is round, you know you're it's gonna be off." Mm-hmm. And he's like, all right, all right, it's it's in place. You know, can you can you see the light? And he's like, I, I don't see anything. And he radios the guy. And he's like, okay, uh, rate, uh, what is it? Lower it or raise it or whatever. <laughs> and you see the light. And then it goes, then the documentary goes black. And it's kind of like, you know, come on, guys. <laughs> oh, man. But there, there's several experiments that they did that failed almost every time, you know, where they're, they're trying to do things with GPS and gyroscopes and, there, it, it's a. I'm sure it, it's like an internet I'm joke. Sure th- it, it started out as an internet joke that went <laughs> went wrong, and and the internet is the only place that could cause something like this. I think uh, 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 where we've got despite, photographs of the Earth. Despite and, all that factual evident, evidence, Tyler. Despite their thing maybe went wrong, I'm sure they remain steadfast yeah. in their belief. It, you know, and that's the thing. It, it you can't grab them and say like you can't say let's go up in a spaceship because we don't have that luxury at this point, you know. <laughs> but you, you could you But can, you can, can get on a ship, Tyler. You could. You remember Alex Alex Jones? And th- that's still hard though. You can't I can't if if say it's one of our friends, I can't say, hey, we're gonna take months of our time off and we're gonna go on the ship and circumvent the earth. You know, we still can't do that. So it's still hard to get them in a situation because you show them pictures of satellites and they say, well that's all fake. It's very hard. That that's the reason they're still around is because we can't physically take them to space you know we don't you, nobody's gonna fund a trip to antarctica uh if you're eddie bravo tyler you can afford to take the time off eddie bravo he, he why took, didn't you get on that ship why yeah. didn't you alex jones was gonna pay for the ship to take you to yeah. the end of your flat earth why <laughs> did you not go yeah he turned he's, he's too busy he's got he's got more important stuff to do oh, he um, probably had a dentist appointment yeah <laughs> so it's, it's okay oh yeah well what a crazy episode that was Goodness. I um what's crazy is some of the stuff that he said is true. You know, like with the the some of the <laughs> the wild, you know, with the five G technology and oh, the yeah, human yeah. animal hybrids are there's real evidence. That's Alex that's Alex's niche though. He struck a he's he's he, he's probably gonna make some people mad, some of my friends mad that think he's awesome. I got some friends that think he's crazy. Alex's niche has always been treading the line against saying some crazy stuff and saying some stuff that's kind of true. Mostly, I think he's a charlatan. It's entertaining as heck to watch. Yeah. But like that that episode, I, it was, what was it, four hours, five hours long? Yeah, and he he is actually a character. You know, yeah. I think he's even said that before. Like <laughs> on the show, he's he's portraying a, a characterized oh version of himself you know, well, for, that, for entertainment purposes. So that episode, I was like, oh, I'll watch a little bit of it, you know, because I wanted to, because that was after the whole beef between him and Joe Rogan. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, well, mainly from you know, Alex. I mean, Joe was fine with whatever. But so I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. It's coming on the show after after screaming and raving against Joe Rogan. Yeah. So I'm like, I watched some of it. It was like a, a mix between a dumpster fire and a train wreck that I couldn't look away from. I watched the entire. I mean, it took me like, you know, over a week. But yeah. t- I watched the entire five hours of that. It was like a train wreck that I couldn't yeah. look away from. And I was laughing a lot. I'm telling you what, I was laughing a lot. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, and I had to watch it, uh, you know, without the kids around because it's it's so crazy. <laughs> it's so vulgar. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, it's completely uncensored. That's for sure. But yeah, and, and you know, speaking of, you know, kids and family, uh, you know, so me and my kids, we're, once you get a, a family that that size, you know you, you definitely don't eat out every meal. So uh, just because I know you a little bit personally, you know you're on the road, you know going to events, and you're pretty much eating out every single meal. What is your, in your refrigerator right now at this very moment? Uh, my refrigerator right now, this very moment, there is two bottles of cranberry juice, pure cranberry juice, because I'm trying to be healthy, and there's bottles of water. There was an egg carton in there. The eggs are gone. I've I've have been to Walmart in like three weeks. Um, what else is in there? And that's it. <laughs> well, there's you know some mayonnaise and mustard and yeah. But as far as food content, very little, Tyler. <laughs> there's more plastic in my in my refrigerator than there is food. So, are you interested in learning how to, you know, do the meal prep thing, or are you? You can't call me lazy in too many things, no. uh, Tyler. You can call me lazy in two things. Uh, one is 
reading, mm-hmm. actual physically reading a book, and the other is cooking. Yeah. Uh, I am, you know, now, and I, I'm also tremendously underskilled. I'm a klutz in the kitchen. Now, right. I can follow instructions. I'll help somebody cook. I'll chop up whatever you want to chop up. I'll do whatever. But, you know, I'm a single guy. I'm not doing a lot. Of, I, I, it's like it takes me th- three or four times longer to do any process in the kitchen than the average human. Yeah. And so um, my cooking is pretty much relegated to egg sandwiches on the weekend. But I, I think you've really capitalized on the eating out, though. Like, just today, uh, <laughs> just a random post, he tagged, you know, probably 20 people in, you know, let's go let's go get tacos. And, and I, I saw on Facebook, you know, I couldn't go because I was here, but there's a, a whole rectangle table longer than this one of business leaders in the community you know, that, that you got to go eat lunch with. And, and a lot of the functions, so, you know, you're going to eat lunch at Rotary mm-hmm. and things like that. And, and so yeah. you've, you've found, a, you know, these people are going to eat once, <laughs> you know, a couple of times a day anyways. You might as well do it together and get something out of it. I mean, what better on a Friday than to hang out with your friends and make new friends and around tacos? Yeah. So we try to do that almost every Friday. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's uh, something I did early on was, and I learned this from John Arcana was, you know, invite someone to lunch that you don't know. Mm-hmm. And at first they're going to think something like they're going to try to sell me something. They're they're <laughs> not going to know why you asked. And it's just getting to know them. Yeah. And, and it most of the time you end up doing business with each other further down the road when you, you don't put, you're, you know, you're not going to go to lunch for, with somebody the first time. And, yeah try to give them a hard sell of whatever, you know, your motive might be. You just generally want to get to know them. And yeah, I find I, f- I found myself, you know, making a new making a new friend, getting to know this person. Man, I find, you know, I like this person a lot. I'm, I'm like looking for a reason to do business with them. Yeah, John actually did it to me. It was before, <laughs> be- before we knew each other. Mm-hmm. And and I'm, the first time, and I didn't know him very well at all. I just, you know, I knew he was a realtor. I'm thinking, man, he's going to hit me up with a pyramid scam. And, mm, yeah. like, and it's going to be awkward. And... <laughs> You know, he started out just wanting to know what I was up to and, and where I came from and what was my story. And so that made me wonder about him. You know, so he told me and we talked about things that we're doing and ways we could help each other. And, you know, he's one of my best friends, you know, to this day because of that. And I left that meet, that that lunch thinking, wow, you know, this whole time he didn't even try to, you know, what, what's your situation with your house? You're buying <laughs> or selling, you're investing. No, it, it wasn't anything about that. It, mm-hmm. it was all him focused on me, what he could do to learn more about me and what he could do to help me in my professional development. And, you know, I think that's something that, that he does with a lot of people, uh, to, yeah. to, to build those relationships. You know, he's, he's very big on, uh, relationship building. And so I've tried to adopt that same pattern, you know, for myself. So thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, John. We had a good lunch too, a, a while back. I need to do it again sometime. He's, Good, good guy to get to know, John mm-hmm. Arcana. Yeah, very well connected and very sharp for a young yeah. age. You know, he, he's quite a bit younger than me, and is uh, I think he just turned thirty. You know, this oh, okay. this, this pat uh, last year. So, dang, dang, John, you look bad. For no, I'm just picking with you. <laughs> I'm just picking with you. I'm just now. I keep wanting to take him shopping with me because I need to, you know, use him for a style consultant. I know, right? <laughs> he's probably. He's probably the most GQ guy in the Golden Triangle, this John oh, yeah, Arcana. Yeah. With salmon pants and, uh-huh. uh, you know, a button-down and the Ray-Bans. He uh, looks like no, he walked off no, the— No huh? socks with the— No socks with the— loafers. I'm telling you, yeah. he looks like he walked off the cover of a magazine Miami every Vice. day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I like his—he's uh, got some pretty slick uh, videos on, on, you know, his uh, advertising videos on uh Yeah, we're always trying to Facebook learn from too. each other and— you know, one up each other in a friendly <laughs> way for, for mm-hmm. social media engagement, you know, mm-hmm. videos and interesting posts and things that we can do where, uh, you know, it, it's, I do a lot of stuff on my own. You know, I've, I've got a whole bag over here of a, a camera tripod, uh, a lapel microphone that plugs in because it, it's hard to find someone every time that you can, pr- you know, produce a quick video. And You and, do some pretty cool stuff. I didn't, you know, I didn't realize some of that stuff was just you. You do some pretty cool stuff. You got some pretty cool. Man, the majority of the time, it's me pushing play, r- <laughs> running around, you know, filming yeah. it, running back. And, it, and it's edited, of course. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm just trying to get better at doing it myself. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly looking for like an intern or something that I can yeah. use to help me out with this, uh, you know, getting the studio ready. But, uh, you know, for now, it's, it's just a, it, this is a, it's a hobby. It's not a, not necessarily a side hustle I would consider. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to see where it goes and see where it takes off. Well, I'm so. glad you're doing it. I, I, I'm always, I always, uh, admire people that, 
you know, you think about a lot of, you know, you're all, you're always trying to better yourself. I can mm-hmm. tell. Uh, respect the heck out of you for you know you're such a so good with your kids. Mm-hmm. Like you're in your kids' lives. That's man, major respect there. You're always trying to think and learn and. Um, so uh, that's the kind of people I want to be around. I oh, appreciate the kind words. And, but yeah, man, is there anything else you wanted to leave the people of, the, I was going to say Southeast Texas, but I, hopefully people are listening to this from all over. So, uh, they better if they're smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I am, uh, completely blank from right now. It's been fun. <laughs> well, let's wrap this up, man. I, I think we did over an hour. That was good stuff. You're super intelligent, uh, great friend. Very interesting. Appreciate it. And I'm glad you could be one of the early ones on my show here. So, Thanks for inviting me. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome back anytime. Give us an update of what you're up to. I know you got great things in store. And, uh, you know, just want to wish you the best. Uh, I quit saying good luck. I started saying, I know you're going to do great out there. I like it because it's purposeful. It's yeah. it's uh, it's determinative. It's not just uh, say something and fall back on. I yeah. like it. I, I like I, it. I didn't want people to be dependent upon luck when it comes to their their good fortune or their career. I want them to know that they're, they're empowered and, and they can be in charge of that. So I try to – they may not do a great job that day or that week or whatever I tell them, but that's positive energy that I'm telling them. Good luck is a maybe. And so I'm speaking positive energy towards them. I know you're going to do great today. So I'll leave it with that. Uh, It's Friday. It's the weekend. I know you're going to do great out there, Ty. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks. Do great out there, folks. Bye. Man, another great episode, but only because I have great guests. Hey, you can find me next uh, Tuesday. It's going to be Tuesday, July the 9th. I'll be at the Avenue in Port Natchez. It's a coffee shop, a sandwich stop, great place if you've ever been there. Um, It's going to be a Southeast Texas Young Professionals breakfast event. It's called Breakfast with the Boss, and it's going to be uh, with the BASF Total Petrochemicals uh, Government Affairs and Public Relations Manager, Carol Hebert. This is a great event. Uh, Stop by and check it out. The Southeast Texas Young Professionals is an organization for uh, members of the community that are aged 21 to 40 that live and work in Southeast Texas and beyond. And it's a great networking group. Uh, All these people are very driven and successful. They're going to end up being the decision makers and the presidents and the CEOs of companies in the future. So it's an organization that's really great. And uh, I love the Breakfast with the Boss because you get to meet an influential member of the community and kind of have a one-on-one and small group setting with them. So check that out. I'm your host, Tyler. Thank you for listening to the Tyler Knows Everything podcast, where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. Have a good rest of your week.